Uxbridge changes election sign bylaw. Casty McMullen, Uxbridge. City Council voted to remove requirements for the minimum size of election signs during a special council meeting August 17th. The council's reasoning for doing this was to give candidates more flexibility. They also voted to allow candidates and third-party advertisers to place signs on motorized vehicles as long as they weren't parked on township property. The old election signs bylaw was passed and put in place April 16th by council. No policy or bylaw is perfect, Deputy Clerk Catalina Bloomberg said at the meeting. Once it came into action, it came to my attention from candidates that the minimum size requirement was very stringent, and it didn't follow the standard sizing for signs. The reason for the minimum size sign to begin with was so not to create a distraction that could have become a hazard if people passing by weren't trying to read the too small sign. It would also free up some time for bylaw, so they're not enforcing a minimum size requirement, and they're just enforcing the maximum size requirement, Ms. Bloomberg said. The council, minus Gord Height, who wasn't present, took a recorded vote and voted unanimously. The enforcement of the election sign bylaw is done by bylaw services staff on a complaint basis, or if staff thinks it's a hazard requiring action. That breathes inspiration, joy, and hope. Claudia Sitzma, The Standard, Durham. Nestled within the hills and valleys of Ashburn, on a quiet country road, lies an unassuming sign indicating the entrance to Windreach Farms, located at 312 Townline Road. A tree-covered driveway opens up onto a 105-acre farm that actually, at first sight, resembles a small village. I came to Windreach Farms on this day to provide an update of their services for people with disabilities and was pleasantly surprised by the quality and quantity of their programming and the setting within which it occurs. To begin my tour, I followed a winding pathway dotted with several medium-sized charming houses that host various educational services and sites for corporate gatherings. Then I passed by a full-sized playground, a restored and immaculate barn, an impressive full-sized equestrian center, and many pristine outdoor stalls filled with friendly, highly socialized goats, bunnies, and pigs. The pathway then continued to a horticultural centre and an area for all to get aboard a wagon ride extending off to further fields and pastures, where participants are encouraged to hand-feed cows approaching the wagon looking for treats. Further on, we crossed over a wooden bridge decorated with engraved horseshoes thanking the many donors to the farm, and then we walked past rows of apple trees leading us to a hands-on sensory trail with activities to engage all of the five senses. Lastly, we ended our walk at a pond with a floating dock. Free-range roosters and hens calmly strolled throughout the grounds, and horses can be seen in the background making their daily rounds with happy riders atop, assisted by volunteers walking alongside. Surprisingly, with all the animals on site, about 170 of them, the air was still sweet with the smell of blossoms and freshly cut grass. There is a beauty and functionality here that can only be understood by viewing the facility in person. Windreach Farms was founded in 1989 by Alexander Sandy J. Mitchell, who envisioned creating a place where people with all levels of abilities could come to enjoy the therapeutic healing power of connecting to nature and through positive interaction with a range of farm animals who welcome their attention and care. My tour guide, Carol Dalquist, executive director of the Windreach Farm Foundation, explained, The Windreach Farm programs were created to inspire, empower, and change lives. I've seen so many of our participants come here with trepidation, but the power of the bond created with animals opens up so many opportunities for a rejuvenation of mind and body. And after enjoying some of the sensory and interactive experiences that we offer, their initial fear turns to utter joy. They are able to reach beyond their boundaries, sometimes within the span of a few moments. It is so fulfilling to be a part of this organization, and every day that I come to work here, I feel inspired and fulfilled to witness the true magic that is happening. Windreach Farms has developed over the years into a multi-service facility, providing several programs within each category of adult day programming, education and recreation, equine services, summer camps for youth, and an outreach mobile service which brings some of the smaller animals to the facilities in the community, schools, hospitals, senior centers, shelters, and clubs, whose members can benefit from the education and therapeutic aspects of the Windreach Farm programming. The key to the success of the Windreach Farm is the commitment of over 350 volunteers, contributing approximately 19,000 hours of service yearly, 12 full-time staff, and the dedication of two executive boards that respectively oversee operations and fundraising. Carol Dalquist continued, 
We are a facility that is now inclusive and open to people with all levels of abilities. We have also found, in particular, our equine program, horseback riding, is also most helpful for people suffering from PTSD, anxiety, or depression. As part of our fundraising initiatives, we also host larger gala-type events. In June, we were fortunate enough to have the RCMP musical ride, and on September 15th, we will be hosting a show featuring the Grammy-nominated and Juno award-winning band, The Wilkinsons. Next year, we will be hosting a Superdog show. For more information or to volunteer, please contact Winreach Farms at 905-655-5827 or visit their website at windreachfarm.org. Tech, tech, technical foul. North Durham Sports. Port Perry athletes bring medals home from Ontario Summer Games. Cassidy and McMullen, Scugog. Five out of eight athletes that traveled to this year's Ontario Summer Games won medals in hockey, rugby, and lacrosse. Winning Ontario Summer Games was a really great feeling, Lucy Lee, who won gold in lacrosse, said. It was a tough game, but my team played amazing and I also feel like I had a good game and helped my team out. The whole week was also a great experience. They were facing off against each other in the finals, which was a first for the pair. I felt like I played some of my best games, Miss Laird said about her experiences at the games. Most people never reach this, Miss Doyle said, to be able to play on the best team you can possibly play on at our age. While Miss Doyle's most memorable moment was her gold winning game, Miss Laird said hers was the semi finals. Before the game, my team and I, we went out and were playing volleyball and we got really hyped up and excited, and then we went out and won, Miss Laird said. It was a lot of fun. We made a lot of memories before the game. In order to qualify for the games, they tried out in May against 360 other girls, which was narrowed down to 144. From that, they were placed on teams. I wanted it a lot, Haley Doyle said, but it wasn't 100% sure. Miss Doyle and Miss Laird both come from hockey families, both starting off since before middle school. Kennedy Feesby also won silver in rugby during the games. Like many of the medalist athletes, she has traveled internationally for tournaments, recently having been in Ireland. Emma Woods, who won silver at the Ontario Summer Games, on the other hand, started rugby at the end of grade 9. I haven't been playing rugby long, so to get this opportunity, it was really incredible, said Miss Woods. Miss Woods ended up playing a different position than normal during the tournament, because two girls who normally played that position were injured. So about five minutes before the game, I had to get a talk down from the player that normally plays it to tell me what I was doing. I actually didn't play half bad, Miss Woods said. I tackled the girl like four times out of the five scrums we had. I got a big shout out for that. Currently, Miss Woods plays with the Toronto Rugby Union. She plays both rugby and softball competitively, hoping to attend university on a scholarship in either sport. Arts and Entertainment. Megan Patrick headlines at the Port Perry Fair with Ben Hudson. This year, the Port Perry Fair is fortunate to have two great musical talents grace our stage. Ben Hudson will be opening for Megan Patrick on Sunday, September 2nd at the Port Perry Fairgrounds. There are no advance tickets for this concert as the cost for the concert is included in the gate pass for the fair. There's always a high and a lonesome song that keeps on pushing me along. This line from the title track and lead single of Megan Patrick's latest album, Country Made Me Do It, is a classic country song and serves notice that she is determined to revive and carry the traditional torch. Megan lives hard and loves hard and her songs reflect this passion. She loves trucks, fishing and hunting, riding horses, and all of these elements fuel her countrified lyrics. Think the free spirit of Emmy Lou Harris from those magical days when she performed with Graham Parsons combined with the spark and sensuality of Tanya Tucker, the only female to crack the outlaw genre, and you begin to have some idea of what Megan Patrick is all about. It's been a banner year and a half for the Bowenville native in terms of radio play, live shows, and award ceremonies. Her debut album, Grace and Grit, sprouted four top 20 singles, including her stirring duet with Joe Nichols on the top 10 hit, Still Loving You. In concert, she's performed with superstars like Lady Antebellum, Dwight Yoakam, Kip Moore, and Martina McBride, peaking with a show-stopping duet with Keith Urbane at the Timmins Stars and Thunder Festival. 
She topped things off by winning Female Artist of the Year and Sirius XM Rising Star Awards at the 2007 Canadian Country Music Awards. I did not expect those awards and I was certainly overwhelmed at the time. Now I just feel really appreciative and grateful that my fans and peers felt that I deserved those honours. In one sense, you can say that my career has been kind of short in terms of being in the mainstream and having a record deal. But within the last year, the trajectory has been huge. Country Music Made Me Do It was produced by veteran Nashville songwriter and producer Jeremy Stover and mixed by studio heavyweight Chris Lloyd Algie, who has won Record of the Year Grammys for his work with everyone from Alison Krauss to U2. Megan's debut record had a potpourri of producers, including Nickelback's Chad Kruger and Vince Skill. But this time out, she was looking for a more homogeneous sound, and she feels that she struck gold with Stover. When we started the project, we wrote together, coming up with several songs for the album. Jeremy and I really clicked well, and we had great chemistry in terms of writing. We eventually got a large chunk of the songs together through him and some of the other writers in his publishing company. When he said he'd love to produce the album, I said, well, yeah, I thought you'd never ask. Megan, who now lives in Nashville, co-wrote all but one of the 12 tracks on the album. Some of her other co-writers include Kelly Archer, Brett Young, Dustin Moore, Justin Weaver, Kip Moore, Jason Aldean, who helped pen Walls Come Down, an ominous number about family strife, Case of Beer and a Bed, written with Derek Rutten and J.T. Harding. Megan co-wrote the title track with Stover and Root singer-songwriter Dan Isbell. The singer has recently experienced a lot of highs with the CCMA awards and chart successes that she has earned, but there have also been a few lows, such as the end of a long-term relationship. Country music made me do it, capture some of the peaks and valleys with heartfelt emotion in her traditional country setting. It's just kind of a thing where music in general has been the driving force behind almost every decision I've made in my life. To facilitate my career, it's always been my priority and my number one objective. So you could say that country music made me do a lot of things. I love traditional country music. My passion and my goal has been to bring a little more of that traditional sound into the mainstream country market. A lot of what's out there right now is more on the pop side of country, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just not what I want to do. Meet Ben Hudson. Ben Hudson is a country singer-songwriter from Uxbridge, Ontario. His smooth, rich vocals have been compared to Josh Turner and Brothers Osborne. Although his country rock influenced singing, although his country rock influenced songwriting is similar to that of Eric Church and Aaron Lewis, his self titled EP was released in early 2016, gaining the attention of CMT Canada, who made him their fresh face artist and also earned him a nomination at the 2016 CMAO Awards for Rising Star. In June of 2016, he released his first single, Redneck Summer, to country radio. In its first week, the single was in the top five DMDS downloads and added into rotation at many major market stations across Canada. This strong debut helped secure a spot at the inaugural CMT Music Fest. TopCountry.ca named him one of their top artists to watch in 2017, and the Country Music Association of Ontario selected him as their January 2017 Artist of the Month. Ben recently opened for Juno Award winner Brett Cassell on his 2017 Ice, Snow, and 30 Below tour and his 2018 We Were That Song tour. He is currently in studio recording a new single to be released this summer. The Standard Podcast was produced by Greenstream Studio for The Standard Newspaper. 